Hello everybody, it's approximately 3.11 a.m. It's All Hallows Eve, and I wanted to tell you guys a little bit of a story about myself. So this is partly what's a few things that have been going on over the last two months, and some things that have been going on for a long time with me. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the underground military base at White Sands, New Mexico, at the Proving Grounds, where they test missiles. We're going to talk a little bit about a hypnotic regression that I did with James Rink. And we're going to talk about something really unusual, which is a soul transference and soul fragmentation memory that I had. And this is going to be a revision from the first video that I did on this subject or on this memory from probably, I would say, maybe six or seven months ago. It was one of the first couple of videos that I did. And when I did it, I was I actually did it under false pretenses. I was um, I was programmed to think and to see this particular memory that I had in a certain way that was wrong, and it was done deceptively to keep me from waking up and understanding what I am and who I am. And so, also too, if you go back and I, I've thought about taking that video down, but I may just leave it up. I'm not sure. I'll probably take it down after doing this one, but. If you want to go see it, I'll leave it up for about a week. Go check it out because what you'll see is a scatterbrain version of me that's being mind controlled and prevented from, from actually conveying what really happened to me at the best and in the best possible way. So let's get into this. So I want you to <clears throat> remember one thing. I had a hypnotic regression. It was the first week of September of this year, of 2022, with James Rink of super soldier talk and if you're not familiar with james check out his channel look up super soldier talk here on youtube he has a website he does some amazing work and he has been instrumental in getting a tremendous amount of, of important disclosure out to the public and out to the people of the world so i highly recommend his channel and um, he helped me because he did a free hypnotic regression session for me um, uh, in the name of research, which is something rare these days because everybody's out to make money and the research is secondary to that. So let's get into this. So remember, I did the hypnotic regression. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Okay, so where do I start with this? Okay, well, first of all, I want to talk about a memory that I've had. Actually, this really wasn't um, an actual memory, so to speak. What it was is, is that for about 20 years, this is during my teenage years through my middle adulthood, because I'm 48 years old, I'm almost 49. I'll be 49 in a couple of months. So um, what they did was, and this happens to a lot of us, when we're abducted, or we're put through these programs, what the extraterrestrials do is they will create an artificial dreamscape and they will implant this dream into you when you're sleeping and this dreamscape will contain small memory fragments of something that actually took place and it's a way of kind of either distracting you and sending you down the wrong or sending you in the wrong direction or it could be that they're attempting to wake you up to get you to become a social influencer regardless of what it is and regardless of why they're doing it um, that's really what it is. It, it's it's just simply it's not something natural. It's not something normal because if you've been abducted, <clears throat> the U.S. military is involved. There are no ET abductions that take place in this country or in this world that does not involve a human government and a human military and human intelligence agencies. So let's just dispel that lie right now. Nobody gets abducted on this planet unless either the US military or one of the other cooperating militaries that are involved in this conspiracy are in on it, okay? And that's the big thing that they're covering up in the media, in movies and everything else, and that's why I don't get any exposure because I'm a threat to national security for that reason and others. I'm a threat to the status quo, I'm a, I'm a threat to the, the fake disclosure that we're seeing right now within UFO community 
and within the mainstream media as well as from the government. So that being said, let's talk about this. Okay, so for 20 years, I had this unusual dream about being in an underground military base. It was a U.S. military base because in one of the, in one of the dreams, I saw a giant mural on the side of a wall in a huge hallway that had aspects to it that I could recognize were from the U.S. military. I do not have a clear recollection of it, but it was military, and I saw people, Caucasian mainly, walking in military uniforms with all of the different adornments that you would see with people high up in the United States military and other militaries, okay? So this dream was very repetitive. Sometimes I would have it several times a week. Sometimes I wouldn't have it for six or eight months, but other times, you know, it would sometimes they'd come in strings where I'd have it for several nights in a row. And other times I would have this dream and I would wake up, go to the bathroom, whatever I had to do, go back to sleep, and I'd be right back in the dream again. So what would always happen is that I would be someplace and I would kind of stumble across a, a door, a cave, um, a hidden stairwell. There's my nose again. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> so, but, um, you know, when you can't touch your nose, you're not supposed to, it itches. So I think it has a brain or something. I think the, I think the nose is sentient. Okay. And it does this to you to, to annoy you because it's not just sentient, but it's a prankster and it's a pain in your rear end, but it's also an itch in your nose. So anyway, <clears throat> I, every time I had this dream, I would find some entrance to get into this particular uh, underground installation. In one particular dream, I there was an off-road vehicle area near my house, which I don't have anything like that. I live in a very concentrated, overpopulated suburb. So, and I'm right in between DC and Baltimore. So I've got two death cities there. I'm right in the middle of it. You know, you can almost smell the dead bodies. So, there was this road with some woods on it that's in not too far from my house and, and I dreamt that there was an off-road vehicle area there. I went there and I went caving. I um, was exploring a cave and then when I went there it looked like it looked like the desert. It literally turned into the desert southwest of the United States. And there was this big giant boulder and you crawled under a hole that was underneath the boulder and you went into this really, really tight pinch of a crawl. And it opened up into a cavern and at the end of a passage. There was a metal door with a security camera. I opened the door and I went in it and there I was, was I was in an underground military base. And I have some pretty clear memories of this base. It's weird. But, um, you know, I always associated with just an unusual repetitive dream and I never understood. And I remember watching UFO programs on TV shows back when I was a kid and abductees would talk about having dreams of being abducted, dreams of being taken to an underground military base. And, um, you know, I, you know, I thought that maybe, maybe I just had such an, infatua an infatuation with the extraterrestrial topic that I was just, my subconscious mind was just dumping information out and just, and I was having these unusual dreams. So in one particular dream, um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I was in this base and, uh, I was walking down these hallways and there was people all over the place. There was people in military uniform, combat fatigues. There's people in lab coats. Um, these hallways were massive and they're very, very big. I've been on, I've been to Capitol Hill multiple times doing activist work. And I thought that the hallways of the Senate buildings were quite large, but these were much, much bigger. Some of these hallways could, could actually, if you took two tractor trailers and put them side by side and then stacked another layer of trucks on top, you would have room to walk around. Okay. You'd, you'd be able to walk around a circumference of this. Um, some of the hallways were huge. Some of them were smaller. Um, the hallways that I remember were big, but they also, and some of them were small, but, um, the ones that I remember specifically had normal sized doorways. The doorways were, you know, maybe at the most 10 feet high, but, um, it's just an estimation. They weren't anything out of the ordinary, but the problem is, is that in, in the memories, I could have been much bigger in stature. I don't know. Um, so in one particular memory, I, rem I remember walking down this hallway and, um, I passed this big big emblem or logo on the side of this wall. It was a big white um, wall, probably made out of stone or some kind of concrete, but it had, um, it had this big military insignia, much like, now if you've noticed, um, 
I used to have a, a an Orion symbol on my uh, my YouTube channel as my logo. I and then I went to a Palladian symbol of some stars. Well, if you look at it now, it's the White Sands Missile Range logo, and I thought that was the most appropriate logo for me to use because that base in my soul have a, a very very long and um, not only illustrious I would say a very dysfunctional relationship um, that base has been the source of tremendous suffering in my life and I thought it would be fitting to make it into my channel logo and to essentially just go with that to for the full duration of this because I want people to see that and question it and I want the government to see it and get pissed off because I'm exposing them and they deserve to be exposed so anyway in this particular memory I walked past a room and it was a lab room when I looked into it it did not look normal it looked like the entrance to the room or it looked like the room itself was um, full of water but the water wasn't escaping the doorway it was like the surface of a swimming pool the best thing that I could um, the best example that I could give you would be if you've seen the Stargate movies or the Stargates I think they made one Stargate movie but um, they also did a series a long-running series of multiple seasons and it was Stargate you know it was Stargate 1 Stargate whatever it was but the Stargate itself <clears throat> when they turned it on on the show and in the movie it looked like water it was like like um just like a kind of like like you walk through water and that's exactly the way this looked like and it I thought when I was a kid and I remembered this and I had the dream I thought maybe this was like liquid air like some like whoever was in the room needed a different form of atmosphere that was more fluid but now when I look at it and I think about it now because there was the impression I got that there was some kind of some sort of density change in the atmosphere um, there's something different about the atmosphere but when I looked in the room there was just, there was a, a monitor up on the wall there was somebody standing there in front of it uh, there was a lab counter to the right one of those long long lab counters like you'd find in say like a um, high school or a college chemistry or science lab and um, it, it it looked like there was air inside the room it didn't look like there were like some type of an aquatic sort of atmosphere was going on there so <coughs> excuse me so what I think it is is I think that there was some type of an energetic field that was in that doorway that was preventing the atmospheric composition of what was in the room from mixing with what was in the hallway so in other words if the people inside that room needed a specific type of atmospheric composition they could work and can be completely safe inside that room and anyone else could come and go in and out of that room without affecting anything they could just kind of go in there wouldn't be any leakage because this force field or whatever it was would would shield the hall the air in the hallway from the air in the room and you could go in and out of it and it wouldn't mix that's what i think it is it's the only thing that makes sense to me but the point is is that I had these memories uh, they were in the, inside the dreamscape so this was going on for 20 years now I don't I only remember a couple of these dreams but I just remember having them very very regularly and they were very lucid very real <clears throat> and the interesting thing is is when I was in these dreams and I was in this space no one would make eye contact with me it was just as if I was being looked through and instead of being looked at um, I always felt that I didn't belong there when I was in these dreams, but yet I felt I did. I felt that I was welcome to be there and supposed to be there, but that I shouldn't be there because I didn't fit in. I wasn't, I felt like I was out of place. Um, apparently I wasn't. So <clears throat> that was something that's always haunted me and it's something that I've always remembered. Just like the incident that I just did a video about, about being abducted at age six. That particular image of those people dressed in navy blue that were had the same build the same look looked like they had masks on that looked like aliens and uh, you know I thought that that was a product of my imagination as a kid and but I always wondered about it because it just didn't feel right and it was an anomaly that I couldn't explain with any conventional form of explanations just like these memory I mean just like the just like the underground well just like the dreams of the underground base it just doesn't add up unless it has some validity to it in connection to a real event
and it does. So remember, I did the hypnotic regression with James Rink. So now we're going to get into something a little bit different here. Um, when I did the hypnotic regression, <clears throat> I gave James Rink two things that I wanted to explore. One of which is I wanted to try to open up that memory and find out what happened to me when I was six years old in the park down the end of my street from my grandparents' house where I, I grew up. And the second thing is that I wanted to find, I wanted to probe this memory. Now this is interesting. This is the soul transference memory. I wanted to find out more about this memory. Now this was a memory because it differs from everything else. And <clears throat> the way this worked is, is when I first had this memory, it, if I go all the way back and I reflect on this, what I find is, is that this appears to be my very first memory. This appears to be the memory that I had before those memories of being a baby came through. And I have an unusual level of memory recall. They say that you're not supposed to remember anything before age two because the brain hasn't developed properly to store long-term memories. But in my case, that's not true. Um, I can remember all the way back to being almost a newborn. I, in fact, I can remember getting my polio vaccine in the hospital, which I think was a couple of months after I was born. Um, so I can at least remember back for close to three months after birth. And I remember getting that and I remember the shots. I remember crying. I remember a lot of things. I remember the food that I didn't like. I remember the brand of the baby food. Um, I just, just the, you know, the label I remember being, having, I remember having my diaper changed. I have an incredible level of, um, very, very early memory recall as a, as a very young child and a baby. So I think that this is my my earliest memory, but it could have came back. It could have surfaced later um, in the first couple of years of my life. I don't know. I can't pinpoint that. But the way this worked is, is that <clears throat> what I remember is, is that, and the way this started is, is when I first had the memory, it was in a white haze and I couldn't, I couldn't pick out what was around me. I thought and this was the intent by the ETs that allowed me to remember this was that they wanted me to think that I was in heaven and that these were angels. <clears throat> and that's exactly what I thought for many, many years of my life until my early teenage years, 15, 16 years of age. That's when things started to change a bit because I started having flashbacks. Now, there were some things of this memory that I'd forgotten. But for the most part, it looked like something like what I called a pre-birth memory. And back then, when I looked on the internet, when I really started to explore this, there wasn't anything about pre-birth memories. In the last couple of years, I've heard about that, and I watched a couple of videos of people uh, talking about they've had these pre-birth memories, and they're with angels or with God, and, and you know, it's always got some type of religious theme to it. I've never heard anybody talk about something like this. And... Um, this is totally different because when I got to my middle, middle of my adolescence or towards the end of it, I was mid, you know, mid teens, 14, 15, 16, between that point and my early twenties, I began having flashbacks of this memory. And there was a portion of the memory that I'd forgotten. And the flashbacks came to me in perfect chronological order. And it, it, I would get a piece of it. And then I'd have another flashback, maybe a few months later, a couple of weeks, a day or two, whatever it was, it was like bits and pieces and they just started falling in. And it was like, what happened next was, was the next thing that I remember because they were in consecutive order. But when I started to remember these, they were not in a fog anymore to the same extent. I could actually now make out things. It wasn't crystal clear, but I could see my surroundings and I knew what it was. And I had a greater level of memory recall for this from this memory. So to recount this memory, what I remember is, is standing in a lab. <clears throat> it was a relatively small room. It wasn't that big. Directly in front of me was a, a row of cabinets above our heads because there was three other people in there and they were Hajian extraterrestrials. They had, they were tall, but the interesting thing is I was the same height. So I had to have been about eight feet tall. 
I didn't recognize this in the initial years of this that I've had this memory, but later on, as I started to work with a, a counselor from Project Avalon, somebody that came into my life to, to give me a lot of help, and he's been an immense help. <clears throat> um, you know, without him, I don't know if I could be doing this right now. It's hard to say. But I, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to do this over again without him because I think he was an indispensable asset. But he helped me with this, and um, he helped me understand. He helped me remember as well, very subtle ways. But I recognized that I was the same height as them, so that was a that was kind of a giveaway towards the end here. That was a clue that something was up. <clears throat> so, but I'm in this lab, and and there's um. A row of cabinets they look like they're they're actually wood grain and they're that fake wood grain stuff this is something that you that came out in um, the 1970s I remember seeing this uh, you know they were brown like a brown vinyl laminate cabinet or some type of a formica I think it was formica um, so you know there's a row of dated 1970s cabinets in this in, inside this lab and everything else is space age looking I mean we're, we're talking extraterrestrial level here because it looks very, very advanced. Um, there's a machine that's standing, that's sitting next to me on the floor. It's very big. It's, it's, it's a, like the size of a large MRI machine. If you were to look at a typical open MRI machine, multiply that by two and make it twice as high and the same about the same width. Um, different shape though. It was a solid enclosure. It didn't have a cavity in it, but it had a bed that was coming out of the front of it and <clears throat> the bed had a, a vinyl or something vinyl like foam pad that you laid on and it had a, um, a type of an enclosure that looked like it was made out of some type of crystalline material it was completely clear um, and it, it was hinged at the back so when you laid inside this machine your head was facing the big end of the machine and your feet were just in were actually facing the opposite direction but you were laying on a bed that was enclosed and it had this glass kind of like a it was like a um a dome structure that would come down it didn't have a framework to it, it just like molded out of like one piece so and it didn't have any optical distortions in it like you could look like if you did a <clears throat> if you built a dome like that a, a dome enclosure over top of uh what I've just described to you and you made it out of Pyrex um, at certain areas in the curvature of the dome you would have a thickening and a um, and a regular surface tension inside the glass so it wouldn't be clear you'd have visual distortion it's like when you try to look through a, a Pyrex measuring cup it's not like looking through um, optical glass okay but in this case this was completely clear I mean it was crystal clear like a pair of like fine lenses on a pair of glasses or a microscope or whatever but it was good so it wasn't glass and it wasn't plastic it was some other material some other extraterrestrial base material and the larger end of this machine <clears throat> now this by the way i didn't this isn't the level of recall that i had this is the level of recall that i had gotten when i went under, under hypnosis so what I'm describing you, what I'm describing to you is an updated version from my original recollection of this. Because when I did the hypnosis, I could see this room in perfect 2020 vision. There was no fog, there was no distortions, distortions. It was better than I can see now, even with these glasses. So <clears throat> So just imagine, so now you've, there's a row of cabinets at the top of the room. You've got this big machine next to me. There's a light over top of it that I, you know, there, there's, there's a source of light that's illuminating the top of, of this area where you lay in the machine, but there's no visible source of it. <clears throat> and then there's a bunch of little indicator lights in the room. Now, when I went into the hypnosis session, I saw the room look like it was closed down for the day the lights are out but there was a light above the big soul transference machine and there's a series of little led indicator lights on different pieces of equipment and there was different there's like a a table of some kind to my right um, against the wall and <clears throat> there was a computer terminal on the left hand corner the very far end of the room below the cabinets and next to the computer terminal was a counter or a desk like a like a shelf desk that was built into the wall and a chair and um and just like i said there was tables and just other things and there was just like this um uh lighting that was just didn't have a source it wasn't all through the room 
but it was right over top of the machine. So, <clears throat> so anyway, that's what I remember. Now, what happened in, in this particular uh, memory is that I was standing inside a room um, with three hot J and extraterrestrials, and I was, uh, and, and they were going over what I was going to do in my lifetime. And um, you know, as I was standing there, I remember because I was a bit in a, I was a bit upset. I was a bit in a panic. Now, I was lied to um, early on for about the first 15 years of open contact starting in the end of 2005 up to now, which has almost been, actually it's been longer than 15 years, but about 17, um, I was lied to the true nature of this memory. So I saw it in a completely different way. And this is what got in the way of what I was trying to access in my um, hypnotic regression, which by the way, I'm going to be publishing either tomorrow <clears throat> which will be Monday or Tuesday, either the day after Halloween. So I'm going to be publishing that with a little bit of narration in the beginning. So you get to see what I'm talking about. Um, now, this is the first of a long line of, of hypnotic regressions that I have to do if it's possible for me to find a hypnotherapist. Um, you know, I'd like to try somebody different this time and see if they have a different, more effective technique. Um, but it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to find anyone because the ETs get to them and subconsciously influence them to avoid me. So chances are I may not ever have another regression session um, because they may prevent it. <clears throat> so anyway, um, getting back to what I was saying, um, the first thing that happened is, is I, was, I was a bit upset and I wasn't um, too happy about what they were going to have me do because they told me that um, I was going to be going into a lifetime where I had a speech impairment. Now, this isn't the exact order of the way this went. I'm just going to go through some key events that took place and then I'm going to explain the rest of it. So <clears throat> I was, um, I'm in the lab and I'm standing in, in front of this woman. Her name is Asib. I know that because that's the name that she gave me. Now, whether that's her, truly her name, I'm not sure. But this was one of the, these were three life engineers, and I thought that they were just strictly extraterrestrial. I thought that this room was on another planet because I couldn't see the, the surroundings. I couldn't look and see these dated cabinets that, you know, I couldn't tell that, you know, and, and if I looked at it and I could see it, I would think that the aliens had Formica, okay? It wouldn't have really registered because everything else looked pretty modern and, I mean, really space age inside this room. So I'm arguing with this woman <clears throat> and I'm saying this just isn't going to work. And the interesting thing about this memory is it was in English. We were speaking perfect English, but we were speaking it telepathically. I was lied to and told by the ETs that the reason why it's in English is because we've translated it so that you can understand it based on your current level of understanding as an English speaking person, because you don't know Lalegia, which is the Hajian language that I used to speak. So if I was to remember it in Lalegia, of course, then if that was the case, I wouldn't understand what it was they were saying to me unless I understood the entire Lalegian Hajian language. <clears throat> so I thought, fair enough, that makes sense. And the other thing that was interesting about this is that these three life engineers either had black shading over their faces or they had black boxes. So if you've seen the Rex Bear incident video where I sent him an email that he read on air, on his podcast where he talked about um, having a white, I had a white room memory. It's how I described that it was due to the white haze. He talked about um, how I email, how, how it was in the email that I, that these ETs had black boxes over their faces or black shading so that I couldn't see what they look like. And this is a common thing that when my labs recover memories, sometimes they will have memories of people or ETs with black boxes over their faces or shading. This is um, something that's done for whatever reason, and I believe it has to do with the impact on the person. It has to do with mind control. Exactly what and, and exactly what it does, I can only speculate other than, <clears throat> other than confuse you or intimidate you or lead you to question something. So I don't know what their motivations were to put the black boxes in the memory, but it was clearly an edited memory. And it wasn't something that I recalled on my own. It was implanted. It was put there on purpose. 
So, <clears throat> but I was lied about it, and I was told that this was on Iriseti and Orion. This is the um, planet I was born on. So I was under the impression that this was my home planet, and that this was some sort of um, starseed operation. That while I was being put into an engineered lifetime, is how they explained it. And yes, there is something called engineered lifetimes, and I'll be getting to that soon, probably a thin maybe this week, as I get into this whole thing. But I was thoroughly lied to and I was given the wrong impression about everything and um, so here I am I'm, I'm talking to these people and they tell me that I'm gonna have a speech impairment and um, and I you know and I said well you know how am I gonna make a living and do all this and and um, I just remember the the seed woman looks at me and says says um, you're gonna have to take a handicapped is what she said and she said it very sternly like you're gonna have to take a handicap and I just thought to myself, well, how am I going to make a living? And I thought to myself, I'm supposed to be a teacher. Um, you know, how am I going to do that? And I just thought to myself, well, I guess I'll figure it out when I get there. So when I asked about, I was getting contact <clears throat> that I thought was positive, but it wasn't. And I would ask about what do they mean or what did I mean when I said I was supposed to be a teacher? And they said, well, no, at first they said, um, that's not what you remember. That's not your that, that's not correct. What you said was, I used to be a teacher. So you used to be a teacher as a profession. That was a lie as well. And I was fed all sorts of bullshit. So, um, so then later it became that, you know, that, and this is what's in my video. In fact, I think I talked about this in one of my early typical skeptic podcast interviews. Um, I said that, yeah, that I was supposed to be a teacher. So I was supposed to be some kind of spiritual teacher. I was supposed to be you know, like um, like an Elena Denon or, or uh, Megan Rose or any one of these people or, or one of these people that don't even talk about ETs but just talk about the New Age movement and spirituality and, and the whole thing and, and how, to, how to use crystals and stuff like that. So I had all those preconceived notions in my head because that's what they were feeding me. So I thought that's what it was. Um, in fact, you know, so anyway... Then, right around that point in time when, when that exchange was going on, I remembered this person, this other person who was a close friend of mine. And I thought about how much of a good friend he was. And I seen him, I could see him in my mind's eye, and, and he was a, a young Hajian guy, because um, Hajians look young. They don't, they don't age, and they look very young. I mean, you know, um, typical Hajian person looks like they're in their early 20s, and they stay that way. They don't age. So he looked really young, and... Um, for a long time, I thought maybe he was Asian or Indian or something. I didn't. I had no idea that this that a hot of really what a hot Jan looked like. It just looked like a human being with, um, you know, uh, a dark complexion, golden brown skin, black hair, and so forth. Thin build, young looking. I had no idea what, it, what this person really was. This person apparently, uh, well, I was lied to, and I was told that this was a, a person that was a, a good friend of mine from my past ET existence. And then I was remembering him coming to Earth and having to take a handicap too. And went, and, and um, in, in reality, that wasn't true. Um, but, you know, this person was in one of these military programs with me. So I think you're kind of getting the picture now. So this wasn't on Iriseti. This wasn't someplace else. In fact, this lab was in the White Sands, New Mexico um, underground base. And these three Hajian ETs that I later was that I, which I later got from my higher self were in fact reptilians, who were just in Hajian ET body containers uh, for whatever reason. Um, they switch body containers for whatever purpose it is, and I guess you know the having the Hajian form in that case was better than a reptilian form because if they would have showed me their self as a reptilian, it would have been a red flag. So I guess this was a way to kind of keep it. Yeah, to kind of keep it on the lowdown and keep me confused. So let me get a drink here real quick. <clears throat> so now I've kind of built the scenario. So I thought it was heaven. Then I thought it was on another planet called Urseti, my home planet. And then <clears throat> now I'm beginning to realize this isn't, this is actually White Sands, New Mexico. Now how this all ties together with hypnotic regression and all this, the programming is that when I did the hypnotic regression with James Rink, which you'll see in a day or two. Um, I was under the impression going in that none of this was really the case. I didn't, 
I thought that I was going to unlock some memories from my home planet and things are going to really, you know, it was going to be a good session and I'd feel good about it. Well, I got it from that session in a sort of in a calm panic, um, best, best way I could describe it. I was, um, I was a bit distraught and for the next six weeks I had a pretty bad depression set in because everything that I thought was true about myself was a lie. And I was trapped. And I knew now, I, at that point, I realized why I felt so trapped for so long. It wasn't because I came here to come, to came here to heal and I woke up too much. It wasn't because I was here for, you know, some positive reason to help myself and this was a good place to be. No, no, not at all. I was in a spiritual prison run by Dracos and Orion ETs. I was on a planet where humanity was enslaved and I was here to help them. And I myself had been entrapped by these beings, by these evil ETs. And I was a victim in a program called Project Surrogate, <clears throat> a MyLab program. I was abducted because I was a psychic child. So, you know, and I came into the world to do something positive and they stopped me. And um, how I knew this is because in the um, the hypnosis session, James had me go in this hallway and there was doors on both sides of the hallway and at the end of the hallway. And these doors represented memories. They represented the things that I was trying to unlock from my subconscious. So after multiple attempts, I finally got into the lab room where I could actually see and interact with my surroundings. Things weren't in a frozen state anymore. Things were more fluid. My subconscious was beginning to open up and provide me with the memories um, on cue with, this, with, the, with the hypnotic regression cues because they, what they do is they give you triggers that helps to open up your subconscious and then that information starts to flow. So it'll turn from a visualization to actually something where your subconscious takes over and you start and, and it's like all of a sudden, you know, you're in a movie and you're watching yourself or you're, you know, you're, you're unlocking the truth about yourself, but it's, you know, you'd have to experience it to know what I'm talking about. That was my first time. So it was very stressful going in and I didn't think I'd get what I wanted to get out and I didn't, but I got something quite valuable and painful. So what happened was, is James had me go into this room and the room was the lab from the soul transference memory. And um, I go in it and he has me, I think he, what he told me to do was to create a physically perfect version of myself. He talked about enhancing my genetic structure, my DNA, you know, making the optimum version of myself. And then I looked at myself and I, and I, when I did that, I looked at myself and that's when my subconscious jumped in because when I looked at myself, I saw light tactical body armor, very futuristic looking body armor. It was the body armor that I later looked at in, in some of the drawings from the super soldiers when because there's the exoskeleton type armor that you see in the, the Halo video games. This was the light tactical body armor that people had depicted in the Halo video games and also in drawings that super soldier, um, my lab victims had, you know, drawn that they remembered it was identical to that. Um, that indicated to me that I was in the super soldier program. This was, these were little bits and pieces of clues that, that I have to begin my journey with. And, um, so he then told me, and this was the real revelation of all of it. This is what really got me because this was it. I mean, this was the last thing that I would have ever wanted to, to experience after everything that I've been through. He told me to, well, let me, before I get to that. Oh, hell with it. I'll, I'll get to it now. Um, I stepped out of the room. He, he, he wanted me to go from the room to the hallway and explore another memory or to explore another piece of that one. So, but I, when I stepped into the hallway, which prior to this, I was visualizing as a hallway with doors. Um, there was no hallway anymore with doors. In fact, when I stepped, I mean, I literally, I could see the hallway as I was stepping through the door from the lab. But when I got into the hallway, it wasn't that hallway anymore. My subconscious now brought me back to the White Sands military base. So when I stepped into that hallway, I wasn't in the office building hallway like I had envisioned. I was actually in that underground base that I remembered from those, from those dreams that had the memory fragments. So 
instantly when I did that, and you'll be able to watch this during my hypnotic regression because instantly as soon as I do that, I report that to him and I instantly tell him how I'm feeling. I felt depressed, I felt isolated, I felt out of, I felt trapped. I felt like I was in a horrible place and these emotions started to come out. And I knew right then and there that everything has everything was a lie and prior to that i kept running into things that were symbolic um there was a room full of energy it was actually a wallless room but i could see like uh either a wall or a doorway or something it was like i had to get through it but it was it was a wall of energy that represented programming and that programming was the programming that i've been fed for the last 15 years of extraterrestrial telepathic contact where I was fed a false story and a false history of myself. I had to get rid of all of that and I had to do it <clears throat> by going through this hypnotic regression and facing the devil himself. I had to recognize that I that my life that my soul was transferred not from another planet but from a military base and that what I was was a manufactured personality um, put into a, a, a human body. I'm a soul fragment that has been edited, altered, and fragmented further and put into a human body, a surrogate mother at the 12th week of conception, 12th week after conception, um, in that, um, that everything that I thought I knew about myself was a lie. And as you can imagine, the feeling of that happening, how your entire life comes crashing down and you know, it's bad enough that I said all of these things and talked about myself, but at the same time, it was like, well, I don't care so much about that. I mean, if people think that if, you know, if I've been lied to and I've repeated thinking it was the truth, I, well, I'm not a liar. I'm just deceived myself. And it's not going to hurt that people have a false image of me because I'm really in big trouble here. You know, how the hell do I get out of this? I'm trapped. The last thing I thought about was, you know, it was like my subscribers, I need to walk back this information and change the videos. I mean, that was at the back of my, my priorities, but it was a concern for me. But at the same time, you know, how do I get out of this program? <clears throat> you know, what do I do? And, uh, you know, this was actually after I burned the cords, but at the same time, it was just, you know, where do I go from here? you know, what do I do? Am I really free from this program? There's a lot of questions that I had and, and, you know, just knowing that just blew me away. So, um, so anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. And, um, I hope that you got something out of it. I know it, it helps. It, it actually helps me to get this stuff off of my chest. It may seem a little crazy to you when I say this, but when I go and I do a two hour and 15 or two hour and 20 minute podcast with someone, or if I do these videos and I pour my heart out and I tell you some of the deepest secrets of myself that I thought I'd never tell anybody, it's therapy to me. It actually helps me ground myself and it makes me, it reminds me of why I'm doing this because when I see the response and, and when I hear from people that have been through the same things, it, um, it, it tells me that I'm doing the right thing. And that's what's important to me because I could just stop this. It's not necessary for me to do this. All I'm doing is invoking more harassment from the government, more psychic attacks from these extraterrestrials that have it out for me. But, you know, <clears throat> this is a war. So there, I'm kind of waging this on two fronts. You have the information side of this, which is why I'm doing this podcast. And then you have the other side of it, which is a spiritual psychic side of it, a spiritual war side of it that... Um, it has to do with when I leave here. It has nothing to do with what I do while I'm alive here. Um, so my purpose is going to be fulfilled, and it already has because I've broken away from their system. That was the key for me to go home. That was the key to do for me to do what I came here to do. And um, everything else is just the ch just like the cherry on top. So I don't care what happens to me in regard to this project. I just want to get the word out. I just want to get the truth out so that um, everybody that listens to this gets something from it and hopefully I can help people in the future and hopefully I can help people in the present who are looking to answer questions because it's very hard to get these answers and um, there's few, very few people out there talking about it. So if you are a military abduction, ET military abduction victim, 
please contact me. Um, you can find my email on the about page on this channel. Hopefully, I have a website soon. I've been a lot. Of, I've had a lot of setbacks and problems, but I'm hoping to get that done at some point. Um, you can also reach me through my Telegram group. And if you have a question or anything like that, you can contact me directly, or you can leave it in the comments section. I'm going to be doing a lot more work now. This is going to be kind of a semi, I would say a part-time thing, but there's going to be regular videos, and I've said that before, but I'm actually in that position to do that now. So I've got the upper hand on these extraterrestrials, and I've got the upper hand on my own internal problems that are emotional and psychological. It has to deal with the abuse and the mind control. So I've got the upper hand, and that means I'm going to be able to do some great, I'm going to do some things for the greater good and help some people, hopefully. So... Anyway, guys, I got to get going. Hopefully, I'll have another video tomorrow, being it's Halloween. I don't know. Uh, it's possible. Um, if not, I'll either have one the following day or the day after that. I've got the um, hypnotic regression video to do, and I was thinking about doing some other stuff, and there's a lot of, thing, there's a lot of things to, that I need to cover. And anyway, take good care of yourself. I hope you have a happy and a safe Halloween, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, guys.